Hare Krishna. Today we will read chapter 2 from Srila Prabhupada Leela Amrit, volume 1. College, Marriage and Gandhi's Movement I joined Gandhi's movement in 1920 and gave up my education. Although I had passed my final examination BA, I gave it up and did not appear. Srila Prabhupada. In 1914, the war came and many Indians enlisted in the fight on behalf of their ruler, Great Britain. Abhay saw British airplanes landing on the racetrack in Maiden Park and the newspaper told him of the war. But he was not directly affected. In 1916, he began college. There were two prestigious colleges in Calcutta, Presidency and Scottish Churches. Abhay entered Scottish Churches College. It was a Christian school but well reputed amongst the Bengalis and many Vaishnava families sent their sons there. The professors, most of whom were priests in the Church of Scotland, were known as sober moral men and the students received a good education. It was a proper and respectable institution and since it was in North Calcutta and not far from Harrison Road, Gaur Mohan could keep Abhay at home. Gaur Mohan had long ago decided that he would not allow Abhay to go to London and in the name of education became exposed to the corruption of the West. He wanted Abhay to be pure devotee of Sri Mati Dhadarani and Lord Krishna. Yet on the other hand, Gaur Mohan didn't want to give up his son to become the Brahmachari disciple of a Guru. Where was such a qual qualified Guru to be found? His experience of yogis and swamis had not inspired such confidence. He wanted his son to keep all the principles of spiritual life, yet he also knew that Abhay would have to marry and earn a livelihood. Under the circumstances, enrolling Abhay in Scottish Churches College was the most protection Gaur Mohan knew to give his son. The college had been founded by the Reverend Alexander Duff, a Christian missionary who had gone to Calcutta in 1830. A pioneer in getting Indians to appreciate European civilization, the Reverend A. Duff had first founded the General Assembly Institution for propagation of the gospel through education, at once liberal and religious, on Western principles and with English as the medium of instruction in the higher classes. Later, he had founded the College of the Church of Scotland and in 1908 had amalgamated both institutions as Scottish Churches College. Srila Prabhupada, we respected our professors as our fathers. The relationship between the students and the professors was very good. The Vice Chancellor, Professor W.S. Urkuahat, was a perfect and kind-hearted gentleman with whom we sometimes joked. In my first year, I studied English and Sanskrit. In my second year, Sanskrit and philosophy. Then philosophy and economics. Another professor was J.S. Scrimmagior. He was professor of English literature. While teaching English literature, he would give parallel passages from Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Yes, yes, he would say. Your Bankim Babu says like this. He had studied Bankim's literature and he compared Bankim Chandra Chatterjee to Walter Scott. In those days, Dickens and Sir Walter Scott were two very great English literary men. So he taught us those novelists and the relationship was very nice. Abhi became a member of the English society and would recite Keats, Shelley and other poets to his classmates. As a member of the Sanskrit society, he recited the Gita and some of his fellow students especially noted how eloquently he recited the 11th chapter, describing the universal form of Krishna. He also played soccer and took part in theatrics. Amrit Lal Bose, the, a, a former organizer, organizer and director of theater in Bengal, rehearsed Abey and a group of his classmates in a drama from the life of Lord Chaitanya. Since Chaitanya Leela was available in the public theatre for half a rupee, Mr. Bose argued, what was the need for an amateur production? And his answer was, 
they should appreciate your performance of lord chaitanya so much that after seeing it they will agree never to sin the eminent director was volunteering his service and training these boys <clears throat> but on one condition they would not perform publicly unless he said the production was perfect for more than a year abe and the others rehearsed the chaitanya play until finally their director allowed them to stage a public performance abe playing the part of advaita acharya noticed that many people in the audience were crying at first he could not understand why but then he realized that because the players had been well trained and because they were sincere the audience was moved that was abe's first and last dramatic performance abe's psychology teacher professor urkuhat gave evidence that women's brain weighed less than man's his economics professor lectured on marshall's theory that family affection is the impetus for economic development in sanskrit abhe used a text by ro and web that described sanskrit as the mother of all languages while studying kalidasa's kumar sambhav in sanskrit abhe was impressed by kalidasa's explanation of the word dhira which means undisturbed or self controlled according to kalidas Once long ago Lord Shiva was sitting in deep meditation because the demigods were at war with the demons they wanted a commander in chief born from the semen of Lord Shiva so the demigods sent a beautiful young girl Parvati to interrupt his meditation although Parvati worshiped Lord Shiva and even touched his genitals he was not disturbed his resistance to temptation was the perfect example of being dhir as at other british run schools in india all the european teachers at scottish churches had to learn the local language once professor urkuhat walked past abhe and a group of students as they were eating some peanuts and talking together one of the students speaking in bengali made a joke at professor urkuhat expense to their surprise professor urkuhat immediately turned to the joke jokester and answered in bengali and abhe and the others felt ashamed bible study was compulsory the bible society had issued each student a beautifully bound bible and each morning everyone gathered for scripture reading prayers and hymns one of the professors criticized the vedic teachings of karma and transmigration of the soul in a court of law one cannot be prosecuted for a crime unless there is a witness similarly he argued although according to hindus the soul suffers in his present life for the misdeeds of his past life where is the witness to these misdeeds abe was displeased to hear this criticism and he knew how to refute it but being only a student he had remained silent socially he was inferior and a student had little scope to challenge a professor but he knew that the professor's argument against karma was insubstantial he knew there was a witness some of the students having come to calcutta from small villages viewed the big city and the presence of so many europeans with bewilderment and timidity but to abhay calcutta and the british were not alarming and he even held a certain fondness for his scottish teachers although he looked up to them with a mixture of awe distance and some tension he admired their moral uprightness and their gentle manly courteous behavior with the boys they seemed to him kind hearted the governor of bengal who was scottish once came to scottish churches college visiting all the classrooms the rooms were large holding 150 students but abe had a front row seat and got a close look at the famous governor the marquis of zetland the school operated on the principle of strict social distance between europeans and indians even the bengali faculty members being of a supposedly inferior race had to use a faculty lounge separate from that of the european professors part of the college syllabus was england's work in india by m ghosh an indian the book elaborately explains how india had been primitive before the british rule abe's economics professor would sometimes shout at his class when he became frustrated with their slowness addressing them a 
as representatives of the whole Indian nation, he would say, you should never expect independence. You cannot rule. You can only work like as is, that is all. College life was demanding. No longer was Abhay free to spend hours before the deities of Radha and Govind early in the morning. That had been a boyhood luxury when he would daily pass hours in the Malik's temple before the golden forms of Radha Govind, watching the pujaris as they worship the deities with incense, flowers, lamps, musical kirtan and opulent prasadam. As a child, he had played within the grassy compound of the chapel or watched the men cooking kachoris on the roadside or bicycled or flown his kite with Bhavatarini. His life had always centered on his home at Harrison Road, his mother's talks, his father's worshipping Krishna. These scenes were now past. Now he spent his days within the compound of Scottish Church's colleges. Here there was also a lawn and a garden with birds and even a small banyan tree. But instead of worship, there was study. The atmosphere at Scottish churches was academic and even the casual conversation among the students as they gathered before the notice boards at the main entrance or passed in groups in and out of the main gates was usually about class assignments or collegiate activities. When Abhay was not actually sitting side by side with his fellow students, sharing a classroom bench before one of the long desks that stood row after row in the lecture hall, when he was not looking attentively forward during the lecture of one of his professors, usually a reverend dressed in a European suit, speaking a Scottish brogue and pronouncing words like duty as duty. When he was not actually in the classroom hearing their lectures, on Western logic or chemistry or psychology, then he was at his homework assignments, sitting at a table amidst the bookshelves in the college library, reading from an open book or writing notes while the electric fan overhead rippled the pages, or he was at home with his father, sisters, and brothers, but reading his lessons or writing a paper from the reverend in the lecture hall. He had had to abandon worshipping the Krishna deity he had demanded his father give him years before. He had retired his uh, deities to a closed box. Gaur Mohan was undisturbed that his pet son could no longer attend to all the devotional activities of his childhood. He saw that Abhi was remaining pure in all his habits, that he was not adopting Western ideas or challenging his own culture, and that as a student at Scottish churches, college, he would not likely be exposed to immoral behavior. Gormohan was satisfied to see Abhay getting a good education to prepare for a career after a graduation. He would be a responsible Vaishnava. He would soon marry and get a job. One of the Abhay's classmates and close companions was Rupendra Nath Mitra. Abhay and Rupen would study together and sit side by side in the assembly hall during Bible class uttering their compulsory prayers. Rupain noticed that although Abhay was a serious student, he was never enamored of Western education or ambitious for scholastic achievements. Abhay would confide to Rupain, I don't like these things. And sometimes he spoke of moving away. What are you thinking? Rupain would ask. And Abhay would reveal his mind. Rupain found that Abhay was always thinking about something religious, something philosophical or devotional about God. Abhay studied the Western philosophers and scientists, yet they held no fascination for him. After all, they, they were only speculating, and their conclusions were not in the devotional mood and spirit of the Vaishnava training he had received from his father and the Vedic script, scriptures. The sudden access to the wealth of Western knowledge, which created in some an appetite to study deeply and in others a desire to get ahead in the world through good grades and career, uh, left Abhay untouched. Certainly within his heart, he was always thinking of something religious, something philosophical or devotional about God. And yet as a Scottish church's college man, he gave his time and attention to academic life. One night after his first year of college, Abhay had an unusual dream. The deity of Krishna, his father had given him, appeared to Abhay complaining, Why have you put me away in this box? You should take me out and worship. 
worship me again. Abhi felt sorry that he had neglected his deity and he resumed his worship of Radha and Krishna at home despite his assignment. In the class one year ahead of Abhi was a very spirited nationalist, Subhash Chandra Bose. He had been a student at Presidency College but had been expelled for organizing a student strike against a British professor who had repeatedly abused Indian students. At Scottish churches, Bose appeared to be a serious student. He was, he was secretary of the philosophy club and was working cooperatively with Vice Chancellor Urko Ahad. From Subhash, Bose and others, Abe heard talks of Indian independence. He heard the names well known in his native Bengal, Bipin Chandrapal, who had fought to repeal the Arms Act, Surinder Nath Banerjee, who stalled the British with his agitation against the 1905 partition of Bengal, Lala Lajpat Rai, and most notably Mohandas K. Gandhi. Scottish Church's college was strict in forbidding anti government propaganda. But the students were sympathetic to the cause of home rule. Although there were no open signs of rebellion, students sometimes held nationalistic meetings in secret. When Subhash Chandra Bose urged the students to support the Indian independence movement, Abe listened. He liked Bose, uh, Bose's faith in spirituality, his enthusiasm and determination. Abhi wasn't interested in political activity, but the ideals of the independence movement appealed to him. Many Bengali speakers and writers expressed India's drive for independence, Swaraj, as spiritual movement. For the nationalist, political emancipation was analogous to the soul's liberation from material bondage. Abhi was interested in devotional service to Lord Krishna, the absolute, absolute truth, a conviction he had imbibed from his father and maintained since his childhood, whereas Indian independence was a temporary relative truth, but some of the leaders of Swaraj, while admitting that the Vedic scriptures were indeed absolute, asserted that the original glory of Indian culture could not shine forth for the world's benefit until India became free from the stigma of foreign rule. The foreigners, they pointed out, blasphemed and castigated the preeminence of India's culture. Abe had felt this also. In his assigned reading in M. Ghosh's England's work in India, he had encountered the theory that the Vedic scriptures were impure, recent writings, and that India's had been a spiritually backward culture before British rule and the, spread, and the spread of Christianity. There were many British inserts against the Shastras, such as Abhay's professors trying to discount the law of karma. But if India could gain national freedom, then everyone, not only Indians, but the entire world, could benefit from India's highly evolved Vedic culture. The call to Sivraj, although covert, attracted virtually all the students and Abhay amongst them. He was especially interested in Gandhi. Gandhi always carried a Bhagavad Gita. He daily read Lord Krishna's holy words and spoke of being guided by Gita above all other books. Gandhi's personal habits were pure. He abstained from all intoxication, meat eating and illicit sex. He lived simply like a sadhu, yet he seemed to have more integrity than the begging sadhus. Abhay had seen so many times. Abhay read his speeches and followed his activities. Maybe Gandhi could carry spiritually into the field of action. The Gita's truth, Gandhi proclaimed, belonged in a most prominent place where the Gita not only could be read but could work for everyone's freedom and the symbol of that freedom was Raj. Nationalists sympathize at Scottish Church's college remain underground during Abhay's years as a student. It was a prestigious school. A student had to study very seriously to obtain a degree there and he could then look forward to a fine career. To speak openly against British rule and in favor of independence meant to risk being expelled. To lose education and career, only the most rebellious would dare. So the students met undercover and listened to the revolutionary leaders. We want Savraj. We want independence. Our own government, our own schools. 
God Mohan watched his son with concern. He saw Abhay not as one of the hundreds of millions of instruments meant to change India's political destiny, but as his back son. His first concern was for Abhay's welfare. While worlds events moved across the stage of history, God Mohan concent concentrated on his son's failure future as he hoped it would be and as he had always prayed it would be. He was planning for Abhay to become a pure Vaishnava, a devotee of Radharani. He had taught Abhay to worship Krishna and be pure in character and had arranged for his education. Now Gaur Mohan thought of getting him married. According to the Vedic system, a marriage should be carefully arranged by the parents and it should take place before the girl reaches puberty. Gaur Mohan had gotten his first daughter married in her ninth year, his second daughter at 12 years and his third daughter at 11. When his second daughter was going on 12, Rajni had said, I shall go to the river and commit suicide if you don't get her married at once. In the Vedic system, there was no courtship nor was the couple allowed to live together during the first years of their marriage. The young girl would begin serving her husband by cooking for him at her parents' house and coming before him to serve him his meal or by taking part in some other formal exchange. Then as the boy and girl grew to physical maturity, they would become so lovable to one another that they would be inseparable. The girl would naturally remain faithful to her husband since she would have no association with any other boy as she grew to puberty. Gaur Mohan had many friends in Calcutta with eligible young daughters and for a long time he had been considering a suitable wife for Abhay. After careful consultation, he finally cho chose Radha Rani Datta, the daughter of Suvarn Vanik family associated with the Maliks. Radha Rani was 11 years old. After the meeting between her father and Gaur Mohan, both families agreed upon the marriage. Although Abhay was a third-year college student with no income, it was not uncommon for a student to marry and he would have no immediate financial responsibilities. Abhay did not appreciate his father's choice of a wife. He had thought of marrying another girl, but in deference to his father, he put aside his reluctance. For the time being, he was living with his family and she with hers. So his marital responsibilities of supporting a family would not be immediate. First, he had to finish college. During his fourth year at Scottish churches, Abe began to feel reluctant about accepting his degree. As a sympathizer to the nationalist cause, he preferred national, national schools and self-government after the British institutions, but he could see that as yet no such alternatives existed Gandhi, however, was calling, an, calling on Indian students to forsake their studies. The foreign-run schools, he said, instilled a slave mentality. They made one no more than a puppet in the hands of the British. Still, a college degree was the basis of a life's career. Abe weighed the choices carefully. God Mohan did not want Abe to do something he would later regret. He had always tried to plan the best for his son, but Abe was 23 and would have to make this decision for himself. God Mohan thought of the future. The horoscope said his son would be a great religious preacher at age 70. But God Mohan did not expect to live to see it. Still, he had every reason to accept the horoscope as accurate and he wanted to prepare Abhay. He tried to plan things accordingly, but there was no way to guess what Krishna would do. Everything depended on Krishna, and Krishna was above nationalism, above planning and the laws of astrology, and above the desires of a modest cloth merchant aspiring to make his son a pure devotee of Srimati Radharani and a preacher of Srimad Bhagavatam. Although God Mohan had always allowed Abhay to do what he wanted. He had also carefully guided him always on the path he knew was the best. Now, without interfering with Abhay's decision about college, Gaur Mohan set about to arrange good employment for him regardless of what else might happen. In 1920, Abhay completed his fourth year of college and took the BA exam. Afterwards, with the ordeal of final examinations behind him, 
he took a short vacation. To fill, fulfill a long cherished desire, he traveled alone a day's journey by train to Jagannath Puri. Srila Prabhupada, every day of my boyhood, I used to think how to go to Jagannath Puri and how to go to Vrindavan. At that time, the fare was for Vrindavan 4 or 5 rupees and similarly for Jagannath Puri. So I was thinking, when shall I go? I took the first opportunity to go to Jagannath Puri. He walked along the same broad street where for thousands of years the Rath Yatra procession had passed. In the market, shops displayed small carved and painted wooden murtis of Lord, Lord Jagannath. Although it was not Rath Yatra season, tourists were purchasing souvenirs and in the temple they purchased Jagannath Prasadam. In the Jagannath temple, 56 ginjatik offerings of cooked rice and vegetables were presented daily in worship before the deities of Jagannath Balram and Subhadra. Abe entered the temple and saw the deities. On a side altar stood the murti of Lord Chaitanya in his six armed forms, manifesting himself simultaneously as Krishna, Ram and the sannyasi Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya was famous in Puri, where he had spent the last 18 years of his life, conducting Hare Krishna Kirtan with his followers and dancing ecstatically at the yearly Rath Yatra as the carts were wheeled along the main road, surrounded by thousands of devotees. Lord Chaitanya had danced and swooned in the ecstasy of his intense love in separation from Lord Krishna. Passing over the parade route, Abhay recalled his own childhood pastimes, singing and dancing in the street, the miniature cart, the procession Jagannath smiling, his father and mother Radha Govind. Somehow the fame of Lord Jagannath had inspired him as a child and it had remained within him all these years. Then shall I go to Jagannath Puri, his childhood dreaming of Puri and Vrindavan and his compulsively studying the train tables, scheming since the age of five to travel here, were based, were based on more than just a desire to tour Puri's marketplace and he was not satisfied by once seeing the deity in the noisy crowded temple. He had been impelled to come to Puri as a pilgrim and his motive was his devotion to Krishna. Now nationalism was strongly influencing his life and he had recently married and was facing the decisions of graduation and career. Yet here he was hardly more than a boy walking alone in Puri where Lord Chaitanya had lived and where Lord Krishna's Jagannath still resided. Abhay relished his break from the pressures of duties in Calcutta. He didn't know how the love he felt for Krishna and Krishna's pilgrimage place would fit into his life. He knew that Krishna was more important than anything else. He was God, the supreme controller and everyone's inner guide. But there was so much, but there was so much token superficial service to God. Even the nationalist speaker, although they carried the Gita on their person, were more intent on nationalisms than on Krishna. Only those who were sincere devotees knew the importance and attraction of Krishna, people like his father. An odd incident occurred at Puri. God Mohan had given away a letter of introduction to an acquaintance who lived in Jagannath Puri. Abhay went to see him and was well received. When the man was offering him lunch, however, Abhay noticed a small lump within one of the cooking pots. He questioned his host, who replied, Oh, it is meat. Abhay was unable to restrain his shock. No, what is this? I have never taken meat. Abhay looked at his host in astonishment. I never expected this at Jagannath Puri. Ashamed, his host said, I did not know. I thought this was the best. Abhay pacified the man, but he put his food aside and took no more meals there. After that, Abhay ate only the Jagannath Prasadam from the temple. Abhay stayed in Puri for three or four days, wandering around the holy places and visiting the famous Puri seaside with its sparkling beach and strongly pounding surf. Several times he recognized some of the priests from the Jagannath temple as they smoked cigarettes and he heard of their 
third of other unsavory activities of the sadhus connected with the temple but what kind of sadhus were those were these who ate fish with their jagannath prasadam and smoked in this respect he found jagannath puri disappointing when abhay returned home he found his young wife crying then he heard how her friends had told her your husband is not coming back he he told her not to worry there was no truth in the story he had only gone for a few days and was now back although his marriage had only recently begun abhay was dissatisfied radharani datta was an attractive young girl but abhay had never really liked her he was thinking maybe a different wife would be better a second wife besides this one in india it was socially acceptable to marry a second wife so abhay decided to take the matter into his own hands he made arrangements to approach the parents of another girl but when his father heard about it he called abhay and said my dear boy you are eager to take a second wife but i would advise you not to it is krishna's grace that your present wife is not to your liking take it as a great fortune if you do not become too attached to your wife and family that will help you in your future advancement in spiritual life abhay accepted his father's advice he wanted to obey his father and he appreciated the saintly viewpoint but he remained thoughtful a bit awed by his father's forethought and he wondered how one day in the future he would be advancing in spiritual life and be grateful that his father had done this your future advancement in spiritual life abey liked the idea he reconciled himself to the wife he had been given abey charan's day name was included on the posted list of students who had passed the ba exams and who were invited to appear for their diploma but abhay had decided he did not want a diploma from scottish churches college although as a graduate he would have a promising career it would be a british tainted career if gandhi succeeded india would soon be rid of the british abhay had made his decision and when graduation day arrived the college authorities learned of his rejecting his diploma in this way abhay registered his protest and signaled his response to gandhi's call gandhi's protest had increased its pitch in recent months during the war indians had remained loyal to the crown in hopes of generating british sympathy towards the cause of independence but in 1919 england had passed the rovelt act to repress the move, move for indian freedom gandhi had then called on all indians to observe hartal a day in which people all over the country had stayed home from work and school in protest although it had been a non violent protest one week later in amritsar in the public square known as jallianwala bagh british soldiers shot to death hundreds of unarmed defenseless indians who had gathered for a peaceful meeting gandhi then lost all faith in the intentions of the empire towards india calling for complete non cooperation he ordered a boy boycott of everything british commodities schools courts military honors and abey in refusing his degree was moving to align himself more closely with gandhi's independence movement but his heart was not in it just as he had never given his heart to college studies to earning a degree to his wife so he was reserved about becoming a full fledged nationalist abey had become inclined towards the cause but never really convinced now out of school out of work caring little for his career education or wife he remained at home he tried his hand at writing poetry for the occasion of a friend's wedding he read shrimad bhagavatam and the latest speeches of gandhi he had no immediate plans god mohan had his plans for abey and the college degree had been an integral part of those plans but krishna it seemed had other plans the political protest of refusing the bachelor of arts degree was more a mark of honor than a social stigma and god mohan did not reproach his son for it but abey still needed to take up some kind of work god mohan approached his friend kartik bose and asked him to employ abey dr kartik chandra bose an intimate friend had been the family doctor since abey's childhood he was a distinguished surgeon a medical scholar and a chemical industrialist he had his own establishment bose's laboratory in calcutta 
where he manufactured drugs, soaps, and other products for the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Bose was well known throughout India as the first Indian to manufacture pharmaceutical preparations that had formerly been monopolized by European firms. He agreed to accept Abe as a departmental manager at his laboratory. Although Abe knew little of the pharmaceutical industry or of management, he felt confident that by reading a few related books, he could learn what he needed to know. But when this new young man was suddenly given the post of department manager, several workers became dissatisfied. Some of them were elderly and had been 40 years with the firm. They voiced their dissatisfaction amongst themselves and finally confronted Dr. Bose. Why had this young man been put in charge? Dr. Bose replied, Oh, for that position, I needed someone I could trust like my own son. He is signing checks for 40,000 rupees. I could only entrust the personal handling of my accounts in that department to him. <clears throat> His father and I are very close and this young man is known to me practically as my son. Gaur Mohan felt he had done his best. His prayer was that the principles of pure Vaishnavism he had taught his son would stay with him and guide him throughout his life. Gandhi and the cause of Swaraj had disrupted Abe's college career and Abe was still inclined towards nationalism but not so much for a political motive as for a spiritual vision. So Gaur Mohan was content. He knew the marriage arrangement was not pleasing to Abe, but Abe had accepted his explanation that detachment from wife and family affairs would be good for spiritual advancement. And Abe was showing an inherent disinterest in materialistic affairs. This also did not displeasure Gaur Mohan, to whom business had always been subservient to his worship of Lord Krishna. He had expected this. Now, Abhi had a promising job and would be making the best of his marriage. Gaur Mohan had done what he could and he depended on Krishna for the ultimate result. Gandhi bolstered by his emergence as a leader among the Congress party now openly attacked the empire's exploitative cloth trade with India. England was purchasing raw cotton from India at the lowest prices manufacturing it into cloth in the Lancashire mills in England and then selling the monopolized cloth at high prices to the Indian millions. Gandhi's propaganda was that India should return to making her own cloth using simple spinning wheels and handlooms, thus completely boycotting the British made cloth and attacking an economic base of Britain's power over India. Traveling by train throughout the country, Gandhi repeatedly appealed to his countrymen to reject all foreign clothes and wear only the simple coats Khadi produced from India's own cottage industry. Before the British rule, India had spun and woven her own cloth. Gandhi argued that by breaking the cottage industries, the British were sinking the Indian masses into semi-starvation and lifelessness. To set the example, Gandhi himself worked daily at a primitive spinning wheel and wore only a simple coarse loin cloth and shawl. He would hold meetings and ask people to come forth and reject their imported cloth. On the spot, people would throw down heaps of clothes and he would set it ablaze. Gandhi's wife complained that the khadi was too thick and not convenient to wear while cooking. She asked if while cooking she could wear the light British made cloth. Yes, you are free to cook with your milk cloth on, Gandhi had told her, but I must exercise a similar freedom by not taking the meal so prepared. The cause of cottage industry appealed to Abhi. He too was not enamored with the modern industrial advances the British had introduced in India. Not only was simple living good for the long-term national economy of hundreds of millions of Indians, as Gandhi was emphasizing, but to Abe, it was also the way of life most conducive to spiritual culture. Abe put aside his male manufactured clothes and took to wearing khadi. Now his dress revealed him to whom, whomever he met, British and Indian alike. He was a nationalist, a sympathizer of revolution. To wear khadi in India in the early 1920s was not a mere clothing fad. It was a political statement. It meant he was a Gandhian. So this was the end of chapter 
2. So we stop here and we will read third chapter tomorrow. Hare Krishna.